I'm Tycho, and these are Fighting Words. We're continuing with part two of what your LARP weapon says about you to us. This is just in our heads. Um, I think I forgot to introduce my co-host, but uh, it is again, Sir Erdok. And uh, Hello. So we're going to start off today where we probably should have started off to begin with, but last last episode went long as it is, and if we'd started with Sword and Shield, I think... We probably wouldn't have finished two stick last week. We probably wouldn't have. Um, I actually have no idea how this is going to go because it's either going to be really short or if we're going to go into the weeds in this. We're going to go into the weeds because the difference between a tower, a kite, a punch, a buckler, we're going to get lost in the shields. The sword, it doesn't matter. It could be a sword, a mace, a hammer, an axe. We're not going to dither too much over that. It's the shield that's going to catch us, I think. So anyway, um, so I guess we'll start with the easier one first because it's simpler. Because um, when you get into plot larp with shields and you have to deal with spackets um, or projectiles, uh, the the calculus on shields gets funky in a hurry. Uh, but oh my god, in a battle game, I have never said, "Oh gosh, I wish I didn't have one of these shield people." Can we get a like, few less shields on the field? That, that would be excellent. We want not as many shields as we have now. That's never been a thing that I think anyone has ever uttered. Pretty much. Um, w when I see someone on the field with a, a sword and a reasonably sized shield, and I will say reasonably sized, because if you're out in a line battle with a fucking buckler, um, what are you doing with your life? I mean, if you're just, you know, for shits and giggles, sure. <laughs> but if you're trying to make this serious, examine your choices. But yeah, anything bigger than 24 inches, it's like, oh, good, get on the line. 24 inches being a direct measurement across the face for people who aren't familiar with uh, the way we tend to measure things and refer to them. Yeah, um, you know, that's just so versatile. Um, and just the ability to provide an area of threat and to take up space and the the passive durability is the biggest thing that is always always overlooked um and especially with bigger shields people people always 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 underestimate how useful it is to just be able to stand there and have parts of like most of your body be not target not targetable if, if you position it right, they just cannot hit you there. It, it can't yeah. happen. Yeah, and unless you know someone's bringing a red up to the line, you could just chill. Um, and it's just super useful. Um, honest to God, as a as a field commander, um, I, I I don't think I would ever use another weapon system if I could avoid it. Um, if I have the option, I would go sword and shield. Uh, it's only I I would only go pike instead when I I need to be on the field with the pike because me being on pike is such a linchpin of the tactic. And it helps that the pike is a pretty durable formation. Oh yeah, yeah, that too. Uh, I'm just saying with the pike, I need to be way more invested in fighting. Right. With a sword and shield, um, I could kind of half-ass it, <laughs> like to be honest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like Let me I can kind of post it up in a little here, bit. Take take targets of opportunity. Yeah, no, not even swing. Just just kind of menace it every once in a while, so they they don't think I've fallen asleep. <laughs> um, An but important yeah, just, factor. Just the ability of the ability to just take up space and exist and provide a threat is just so so critical. I will say this: too many people in battle games use shield walls. Um, and I will specify, when I'm saying a line, I'm meaning a line of battle, not necessarily a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder shield line. Um, most of my lines these days are are, are closer to skirmish formation. We, we do a lot more open formation now, yeah. Oh, it's just... It's the engagements we find ourselves in. Yeah, lines are optimal when you have a limited front and you need to stuff as much firepower into that limited front as possible. In every other system, a shield wall, or excuse me, 
in every other in every other scenario, a shield wall is almost certainly going to lose to a skirmish line just because the skirmish line can put out more frontage. When you have a broader line of engagement, you can engage more points simultaneously, whereas the shield is is much more limited, or the shield wall rather is much more limited in its uh, in its reach and its ability to threaten. Yeah, uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Um, that's the other thing that people discount with shields. Um, a shield, a a large shield, will block every attack from at least one from at least one direction. So uh, it doesn't matter if you're stacking up multiple people attacking the same face of the shield. It's they're just as they're just as safe. So unless you really need the mass or you really need to concentrate your force, uh, shield walls are are not not a great idea in battle games. People like them; they're fun. Shield walls are a fucking hoot. They're cinematic. But, uh, yeah. But really, um, from a pure tactical perspective, skirmish skirmish lines are better. But and skirmish lines work with shields. So yeah, uh, shields and battle games, good stuff. Um, on the field, I, I generally prefer people to have a, a strap shield versus a center grip. Uh, center grips absolutely have their place in tournament fighting. Um, I think they're probably superior for it. But on the field, a strap just because. As a pole arm and a spear user, oh my god, do I love do I love to see someone who has a a especially a coreless center grip? Oh my lord! <laughs> you mean a revolving door? <laughs> yeah. Um. High high wrist problems in five years. <laughs> high pronation injuries. Nice to see you here today. Yeah, the strap shield is. Again, going back to the idea of passive defense, it's a lot more comfortable and convenient for long-term carry when you're not being super tactical or super aggressive with it. You just need that shield to be there so you don't die. Strap shields are ideal. Yeah. Um, I would actually say if you're using a coreless uh, center grip, they're nothing. In terms like of weight? Yeah, like in terms of just annoyance to carry them around, like they're oh, not yeah. irritating at all. So, like, eh. if you're gonna do a lot of running on the field, I, I that's that's when your, your coreless center grips are really kind of come into their own. Um, if you're know, gonna be trying, I know coreless straps exist. I've just never been comfortable with using them. It seems like they're gonna break. It does. Um. But we it we use strap like shields very aggressively, though. Yeah. Honestly, like I don't know why you would spend the money. Yeah. Um, it's just it's it's like you can just rest the strap shield on your you know without expending any energy. It, it does. I don't know. I might be weird. It might be just one of these ray things where it's just I've walked. I spent so much so many years walking around with a giant strap shield buckled to me. That I, I don't notice them anymore, <laughs> um, but I really don't. Well, part of that is be, is the way we strap them. Um, if you if you strap a shield properly, then when you're at rest, you're not really holding it up with your musculature. It's like bone frame. Yeah, that's that's true. It it just transfers to the skeleton. Skeleton, yeah. And I guess there's there. You know what? Yeah, because I know a lot of people who have just a straight a straight um, a strap shield with a sh where the the strapping setup is perpendicular to the ground, or excuse me, parallel with the ground. Yeah, that and that's that's garbage. That's no fun. Um, that's that sucks in a whole bunch of ways. Um, yeah, we I we at least do forty fives. I tend to do. I think I tend to do a little steeper than that. I might be moving to like a if I'm be if it's a, if it's a shield that I expect to do a lot of work with. I'm going to move to like a, a more aggressive, uh, like a 65, 65 degree angle um, where my arm is closer to vertical. Um, I've seen some people who fight with just almost a near vertical uh, strapping system, like a 75, 80 degree system. Um, well, not that, for me. And then for my Damrung shield, we have the strapping in direct line with the the keel of the shield. Yeah. Well, that's that's a whole different. That's a weird. <laughs> that's a weird buckler. It, it's a weird buckler. I I like it though. It's 
it it's again be, because of the strapping it it rests super easy um and since we don't have to have the the same level of padding for for a damrung shield it it is probably close in terms of weight to a to a coreless foam shield um no it's heavier yeah a bit I mean, for for its surface area, it it is a lot smaller in terms of surface. If it were sized up to the same size as a foam shield, yeah, the foam shield would win out easily. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's a different. It's a it's an interesting combination. But uh, okay, so I think that's that's enough on battle games. Unless you have to add anything, shields great. Um, oh, the best thing about shields in a battle game, they're a big fuck you to archers. Mm -hmm. Which bo um, bows are also on the list, but uh. Those are on the list. Not Pre having preview. a shield is, is important to to counter the existence of archers. And uh, preview, pre preview of bows. Are you on my side? I fucking love you. Are you on the other side of the field? Fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just did bows. <laughs> they, well, they, there's a good story for bows that illustrates why shields are important, and it has to do with uh, the the manners of a bowman and lack thereof, and how you can very very easily with one or two friends just ruin someone's day completely. Yeah. Um, but we'll get to that when we get to bows. We're still on swords and shields right now. And really the only thing um so we we covered like the standard war shield and the shape isn't super important. I mean kite, teardrop, you use a uh a a pavise now. And I mean you, you don't use the pavise much differently than you might say that again very Whoa. Uh your sound just garbled like crazy. Try again. Uh, like you were broadcasting from cyber. It sounded like you were broadcasting from Cybertron. You still sound like you're coming from Cybertron. Oh, I think you heard up though. Okay, there we go. Good. Goodness, I wouldn't have to go back and re-record all this. I'm not up to speed on my editing software yet, so that's going to be an unfortunate uh, glitch in the program. But we're gonna move on from that. So. So. Uh... Talking about the, the the shape of the shield doesn't <laughs> doesn't have a huge bearing on on what you're gonna do with it. Um, we found teardrops to be pretty efficient, but I mean, there. I don't think there's like a a one true. Well, overall, overall length is more useful than width. Yeah. So that's why teardrops and kites work. Length is more useful than width. Um, and that's just based on the fact that most people throw shots laterally, um, especially in, well, even in the SCA, I was about to say, especially, particularly in battle games like Hearthlight or Amp Guard, where headshots are illegal, but even in the SCA, um, Hello? Oh, goodness. Now what's wrong? Hello? Hello. I think I just yeah, lost we... you. We're having all sorts of technical issues tonight. Oh, all right. Well, you would you like to press on? Uh, yeah, let's do it. One all of right. these days, I am going to have to figure out the editing so that I can go back and gloss over issues like this, but... We're still kind of in our formative stages, and I, th I think uh, just trying to get some material together for now. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So length is more important than width. Um, people throw more lateral shots than twelve o'clocks, um, even in games like the SCA and Markland. Um, so yeah, length is more important. I've never gotten round shields. I've never known why round shields were a thing. Uh, from a functional perspective, from a historical perspective, um, I kind of I kind of get the logic why why duelists like them. Uh, they certainly do open up a lot of shots around center grip, um, like between twenty eight and thirty two inches is is a really fun shield to use in duels. Uh, but on the battlefield, uh, I've never gotten it. I, I like to have a bit more passive protection for my legs. Yeah, yeah, for real. Like, legs and shoulders. Mm -hmm. Legs and shoulders. Like, the round shield is for big, 
it's big where I don't want it to be big and it's small where I don't want it to be small. Like I don't need the widest part of my shield to be at my like torso level. It it opens up a lot of high and low swings, I think, but it cuts down on my ability to throw like close inline chops, which I do like to use a lot. Um and whereas a, a narrower, taller shield I can still use those like close in line um Yeah, like the center line the center line cuts, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Center line cuts and, and thrusts as well. I mean you can thrust uh from low to high, like coming up under a, a round shield. But the the fact that it's as wide as it is, um, no matter how you turn it, like you can't really alter the the angle of your shield to open yourself up for more more shots, except by tilting it, I guess. But that's that adds a whole new di- like weird dimension to it. And it's it's never worked well for me. I'm sure it, there are people who can like alter the the facing of their round punch duelist shield and open up more shot vectors for themselves, like with a fair degree of reliability. Um, it's just not in my skill set. Yeah. Um, and they leave your dick open. Mm -hmm. I will say this is a spear fighter. Um, the way everyone holds their round shields and it doesn't really matter how big they are. because up to 36. I've seen this up to 32, 36. You cover it just because 36 inch shields are huge. Um, (laughs) they're ridiculous, but, um, yeah, most round shields leave, leave the crotch open. Which I appreciate. That that pelvic um, girdle. I love it. Such a great shot trap. Uh but yeah, I'm I'm a stab you in your in your business. <laughs> um, just letting you know. Um so yeah, so I think that's shields for battle games. So now now oh now this is a this is a big topic. Um shields in plot LARP. Because they get complicated. Has, well, well the biggest thing is because the way abilities work, you don't need you don't necessarily need a shield to be a tank, right? Like you could just have things on your character sheet that let you soak damage and block damage and avoid damage. If you can just um, say parry or say flesh wound, it's like having a shield without the encumbrance, and then you're free to go back to that two arming sword, you know, metal loadout that we talked about last week. Or, or even if you just have a big stack of hit points. Right, because that's how I did it at Exile. I just came in with a ridiculous pile of hit points, and yeah, I mean, I use the shield too because I'm a jerk. But... <laughs> <laughs> why, why not double up? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say if you can do it well, why not do it superlatively? Um, but um, but when I was using the two-handed weapon, um, I was just just it was still i was moderately competent at dodging and blocking and i just had a huge stack of hit points so i could just soak damage and just be a persistent pain in the ass so yeah so there's a lot of ways that like it might not be necessary you also don't see like the uh the real the real killers um the spears and pole arms and larps so you don't you don't see that kind of stuff in terms of NPCs, NPCs uh, loadouts. Well, and to the the missile fire that shields also help to insulate you from, are, it's only partially useful to have uh, something against that in campaign lives because a lot of times magic spells, if they hit your shield, it counts as if it hit you. So really, you're only using it to passively defend yourself from the odd arrow or crossbow, which are not super not, common. Not a thing, yeah. Um, like so, I, you know, we had that big battle at the field in front of the castle where I I was using Carrie's bow, and I think out of everyone on the field, I was one of maybe four archers. In in that engagement, and that was that was not a small fight. Yeah, and Dameron and Dameron, I don't think there was ever more than two or three on a side. Usually, not, I know. No. I, I know in one fight um, that I was involved in. There were at least two, and I know that because they they one twoed me. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like it's not common to have archery to have to have projectile weapons that shields are useful against. You don't really need them to deal with NPCs because NPCs 
first off, they tend to be outnumbered in most games. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's very rare to have a game where you're, where you outnumber the NPCs, um, or excuse me, where the NPCs outnumber you. So if you have just simple numbers on your side, passive defense becomes a lot less important. Um, if you can focus on one or two people at once, you can protect yourself against one or two people at once, even with a single sword, even with two stick. Um, you need a shield when you're on a, when you're in a line or in a formation, and you have to worry about attacks from anywhere within 180 degree. 180 degrees of your front that's when shields get useful um but that's not but if, a, a common engagement that we that we've encountered in any of the campaign larps we've been to um there there's more skirm there's there's a lot of skirmishing but like that line line on line combat just doesn't come up very often or has well, i mean yet. the thing is the thing is if you're an npc a shield is a fucking godsend because you need it Right, because you're you're fighting you, against you superior dealing, numbers. I was gonna say you are dealing with that. Everything in front of me is threatening right now. There are threats from every direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you do do NPC, if you do our regular on NPC duty, uh, I get a shield. Uh, just make a simple plank shield because it's a great way to frustrate the players. Because you will you will last so much longer. Yes, yeah, um, especially if it's not a a common sight in the game uh a lot of times you'll run into people who just don't know what to do with the shield yeah they they just won't won't come near you it's crazy and then you get to do all sorts of dumb shit yourself <laughs> um i will say this um i think the more pvp is a factor in larp the more shields come back out uh cuz in, in damrung they were pretty common yes um or at least in terms of a plot larp well, it depends on the faction. I, I would say they were very common in the Nordvik, sort of common in Crownlanders, and the Kerns had pretty much what you expect from a campaign LARP in terms of loadout. You know what? Yeah, you're you're right, and I'm just going off the fact that there were so much many so many more Nordviks than everyone else. Right, and we did fight them a lot. Um, we fought them a lot. I didn't I did not see any co- Crownlander combats other than that one archer. So I have no idea. Yeah, the Crownlanders had more armor, um, but I I didn't see very many shields uh, whenever I was doing, Um, like, force evaluation. I think, oh no, I think we did, when when we did that two versus six, we were fighting against Crownlanders, I think. Uh, Yes. And they didn't have any shields. No, if they had, they probably could have pressed the issue. They probably would have rolled us, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But yes, I think the more PvP, you see the more likely it is for shields to to be a factor um just because you know if the players are doing the majority of their damage by swinging a stick at you something that prevents them from hitting you with a stick is is really critical and again add on to that with the point you made earlier about having a load of hit points a lot of times games will send monsters out with a decent chunk of hit points because they know they're going to be outnumbered and they're going to have to take a lot of hits yeah so that all just compounds and then when you add into that the fact that if you're going out with a shield and you know what you're doing and they've given you a boatload of hit points because you're supposed to be the spooky monster that's going to be a really bad fight for the PCs because that all just compounds you could drag that shit out you can just drag that shit out. Uh. <laughs> then, then it becomes a real stamina fight. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, I think that might... Well, I will talk about the aesthetics of shields because with, with campaign LARPs, aesthetics matter. I mean, aesthetics always matter, but especially with campaign LARPs. If you're not in it for the aesthetic, why? Why, why are you here? Why are you here? Um. <laughs> you, you can drink on your own time. Yeah, uh... So, I always appreciate it. Sword and shield is an underrated look. Um, as long as your shield matches your fucking garb and armor. Because, oh my god, that fucking kills me. Um, if, you're using a, if you're using a scutum, and you're not in Lorica, what are you doing? What are you doing to stop? Mismatched helmets, eh. It's okay. Helmets are weird. Your shoes don't match. 
hardly anyone cares about shoes. Your shield doesn't match your armor. Real shit. Oh, it's just like embarrassing. Like you're Viking for everything except the shit that's strapped for your arm. Like what the fuck? <laughs> like. <sighs> and this is mostly true for shields with a certain style, because there, there's, you know, there's generic-ish shields, but things like a scutum or a specifically painted like round shield. Um, no, 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 round shields. Round shields, round shields can fit round just shields, about everyone, anywhere. Everyone fucking uses round shields, uh, unless you're a Roman. Like, unless you're doing the Roman thing, then no, you have you. If you're doing the Roman thing, you need you lock yourself into using a Roman shield because everyone knows what they look like. Uh, but round shields are kind of universal. And most of the, the round shields I've seen, I, again, th there aren't as many shields for sale as like every other weapon. But uh, most of the round shields I've seen could pass for just about anything. Like they're, they're usually just like wood. Sometimes they'll have like a simple pattern on it. But like there's nothing that really ties it to any particular culture or, uh, or period. Yeah, unless, unless you're going out of your way. Like... Um... Like my shield with the Cairo on it. Though even though even that, like, oh, I've limited myself to twelve hundred years of European history. Oh how my goodness! How impoverished! How impoverished of choice! How limiting! <laughs> um, but um, but like if you if you put like a Norse raven on it, you know any any ta any tattoo you'd see at like a folk metal concert <laughs> <laughs> if you just slather it in futhark and then show up wearing crusader gear no no one's buying that <laughs> no one's buying that um but yeah apart so apart from that apart from like very specific patterns that would lock it in place like a round shield like a, a simple pattern round shield like Two two color two colors on a round shield, and honest to god, quartered round shields look fucking great. Mm -hmm. Like I love that; it's such a clean, nice look. But um, round shields can fit in almost anywhere, but that's not the case for most things. Um, heaters and scutums are probably the biggest, the biggest example of shield that should be tied to a look. And heaters are super common. Like of all of all the shields I see on sale, like LARP shields, heaters are probably the most common. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, but it's the, but it's weird because they're also like super specific. <laughs> like you can get away with kite shields for a long time. Kite, yeah, kite shields still leave you pretty pretty wide open. You're not not as wide open as round shields, but you still got like 400 years worth of inspiration for a kite shield. Um, I think oval shields are underused. I, I would like to see more oval shields. I've always liked those, um, especially like the Roman cavalry shields. I'm, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a big fan. Yeah, any of the like the late ang late antiquity, like migration period, uh, large oval center grip shields. Those are those are interesting. I, I would like to see more of them. But those are actually tied to a fairly specific. You kind of have to fit into that migration period late anti late antiquity you know european iron age look for that to fit there's a pretty, I, pretty solid example of what we're talking about on the left hand side of of our background picture that's uh tim shield from the past of the crown bear that big white oval he had yeah well, that was thing was beautiful it was great um I'm but sure yeah it still so, exists somewhere um he lets this plastic get hard that's true. Then so you, then you can't knows. hit nerds with it as much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I don't... I yeah, wish we saw more bucklers. Yes, agreed. Because um, bucklers are great adventurer gear. They're very practical. Yeah. Um, I think part of the problem is um, foam bucklers are are typically not built to be worn as an accessory so like i think both of us have had steel bucklers where we've put strap um, um belt hooks on them or at least i did 
Uh, I, I just I used like a, too. I used a snap loop on my belt to carry mine. But yeah, same same deal. I had a mount on my belt to carry my my steel buckler. Yeah, I, I did the same thing. I basically made like a, I took a lamellar a lamellar plate, and I bent it into like a a hook, and I just used uh, clinched nails to uh to rivet it onto the back, and uh, it's great because you can just carry it in your belt. Mm-hmm. Um. And but most LARP shields don't have that, and most people don't make their own LARP shields, right? And I, I don't think there's a knowledge that that's common if you're not in HEMA and Western martial arts circles. So I think from a lot of people's perspective, a buckler is just a small shitty shield that has to stay in my hand the whole time. Well, more unfortunately, to most people, a buckler is a shield that you strap on your wrist because that's what it is in Dungeons and Dragons. Um. Also, that yeah. <laughs> And the other thing, too, is that if you're trying to be optimized in combat, uh, bucklers aren't great, even in story LARPs. They're, they're not great. They do take more practice than just about any other type of shield. Um, so if you're using one, it indicates either you're probably really committed to the aesthetic or you actually know what you're doing and went into this knowingly like ah yes i would like to use a shield the size of a dinner plate on purpose i mean i'm not going to say they're they're off meta they're off meta for a lot of people but if you come into a game and you know how to use a buckler and no one else knows how to use a buckler and you can get away with weapon manipulation because that's the other thing you can't always get away with weapon manipulation right but if you can get away with if uh, then 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 don't fight buckler. <laughs> yeah. If, if you can't do that, don't fight buckler. Cause yeah, you kind of need to do a little of that. No reason. Um, but if you can get away with weapon manipulation and if you know what you're doing, you can clean house with the buckler. And the buckler and the, and the mace is such a nice combo. Aesthetically. Such, <laughs> such a, such an aesthetic <laughs> buckler and mace. It's peak aesthetic. Oh, Oh my God. Yes, hundred. Give give me that hundred years war, y- yeoman. <laughs> I still want to do a kill house where we just clear it with bucklers and maces. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we we gotta maybe sometime at EMR. We'll, we'll we'll. All right, you gotta have rigid spine and rigid head. But, yeah, uh, we're doing a kill house with, with mace and buckler. We're doing close quarters battle. That might be an invite only thing. That uh, that would certainly be an invite only thing. Because I bet we can get some of the damn around folk for that. Oh yeah, you know Kevin would be about that. Yep. And you know, you know Zach and Sam would probably be up for that. So, yeah, no, we we could probably get to get some people for this, and then they'll stop being friends with us. <laughs> well, that depends. Are they on our team or the other team? <laughs> Either way, they probably still won't be friends with us after this. <laughs> no, no, I mean the ones the ones who have fought with us, like. Anyone who knew anyone who knew us from Steampunk will, will know what they're getting into, <laughs> and the Scadians will roll with it. Everyone else, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. Um, close quarters battle. Uh, oh my god. So actually, well, let's let's use that to transition because we can transition into pole arms because um, yep. I think I think we've exhausted shields. Um, and especially short pole arms are optimized for close quarters battle. Uh, oh my god, I love short pole arms. You talk about like the four to five foot range. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by, by I'm gonna say a short pole arm will be anything between three and a half to five foot. And we're talking like Dane axe, Paul axe, um, that sort of thing. War axe, yeah. Um, axes, axes. A lot, axes, a lot of axes, things axes. with axe in the title. <laughs> um, also, your war hammers. Um, a, a two-handed sword, depending on how you use it. Um, if if you've got a like uh, for my sixty, I always have the long ricasso on it, and and I can kind of use it in the manner which I think you're you're leading up to. I mean, it's how I fight. It's how I fight long sword. I don't fight with my long sword like it's a long sword. I fight with it like it's a pole arm. Um, so you know, anything, anything that, anything in that 
you know, three and a half to five foot range that you're using. Well, just that, that the, you're the using close range, high leverage family. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the good, <laughs> best way to put it. Those, those are the characteristics that matter here. We're, we're kind of bouncing around length classificate, short range, high leverage. That that's what we're getting at. And, and really most of this family tends to be in the three and a half to four and a half foot range. Five foot, you're getting a little too much. Uh, that's just a little too much weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, it starts to act differently. It, it so, turns into more a support weapon. Yeah. Um, so if you use these in battle games, uh, you shouldn't. <laughs> Full stop. As someone who loves them, you shouldn't. Um, upon, unless you're breaching a castle. Uh, because battle games, because battle games make you so high fragility, um, you don't have time to do what this needs to do, and the approach is too precarious. Um, you have to rely on dodging and your weapon skill to to keep you safe as you approach. And frankly, there's too many people who are too good at getting shots in on someone who's coming at them with a short pole arm uh, for, for it to be super viable. There's also too many um, spears, especially on our fields. Yeah, that's what I mean. Spears, uh, sword and shield. Um, it's just not like these are all the weapons. If you look at their historical use, they were used by heavily armored professionals. These, this is the family of what of, of weapons where you would usually see them in the hands of the heavy, hev most heavily armed foot soldier on the field. And that person would usually have spent a good long time getting good at this um, because they are a pure offensive thing and they are a pure close range thing. And just to make that work is a really specialized skill set. So that was short pole arm. I mean, yeah, from a, a, a battle games, yeah. We I think they're. I think in campaign LARPs we see axes most often in this category. Bruh, <laughs> what do I use most of the time at Dameron? <laughs> you use that in any game that lets you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, in terms of, of op for, like for 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 you, obviously you use the axe more often than anything else, unless you feel like you need the shield. Um. But I don't. Yeah, I I feel like I mostly see axes. It it might be the market. I've never really gone uh, shopping for something in this family, so I'm, I'm not like up to date on what's common. I know there are a couple of warhammers floating around there. Um, I know uh, Troll King used. I forget if it's a Bechta Corbin or a Lucerne hammer. When you get into pole arms, the differences get to be academic after a point. But that was a full length pole arm. Yeah. Yeah, so that that wouldn't, that wouldn't even. Yeah. Um, no, you're you're right. They're not heavily used um, because of all the. Frankly, frankly, these are a, a set of weapons that were designed to be used. Well, they're they're leverage weapons, like Tycho said. Um, they are designed to deliver maximum impact, and it's excessive for most games. And like I said, the, most armor systems don't let them work the way they're supposed to. Um, so there's not a lot of there's not really a lot of rules mechanics for it. Um, I love the aesthetic of short pole arms. I am I am completely and utterly biased in this category <laughs> because um, if I if I were actually ever to be forced to go into a a hand to hand combat. I would either be fighting with my pike or I'd be fighting with my axe. One of the two. Um, and if I had to pick a universal weapon, like I didn't, I knew nothing about what I was getting into except for the fact that I would be in my armor. I'd go with my axe. Um, there's so much you could do with them, but you're not allowed to do it in most places. Um, I love the... Probably why we don't see them that much is because... Yeah. All the things they're meant to do, you're not supposed to do. And then you look at things like Bohurt, where they're allowed to do what they're supposed to do. And they're like easily 40% of the field. Yeah, the fights I've watched, they, they are 
quite popular. Um, which tells you tells you a thing or two. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, the aesthetic is great. You're fight. You're just you're you're fighting an uphill battle if you use it. That's all. Um, I will say I don't like the aesthetic of giant oversized mallets. No. Um, and the, it's just they don't move like they're supposed to. Um, you can get away with it more with a Dane axe. Dane axes, like actual Dane axes, are, are rather lively weapons. So I don't mind so much the. Uh, there's no illusion breaking uh, when a weapon moves like a foam we- foam weapon. It's if it's supposed to be a Dane axe. But if you have something that looks like it weighs 12 pounds on the end of a on the end of a long stick, and you are twirling it about or throwing these little flicky shots. It doesn't matter how good the rest of what you're doing looks like, because you look like you look like a clown. <laughs> you just look like a clown. Like it doesn't matter. Like if you're not treating it like it's it weighs as much as it's supposed to weigh, it looks it looks preposterous. So don't do that. And I but think that's part look- of it too. Is it trying to use a weapon like that in a game like this? You have to kind of work overtime to sell it. You can't just mm. let the weapon do what it does and fight. You have to devote a, a decent chunk of your processing to holding the weapon back, making it look the way it should look for what you're doing, and you know still not get chumped. Yeah. Um, and on, only Einan does it good. Oh, what? The, the huge heavy weapon thing? Yeah. That's true. What do you... He, he when he does. was using my, when he was using my uh, my two handed axe at Leeds, he made it look like it weighed twenty five pounds. Yeah, fortunately, I didn't have to fight him at Leeds. <laughs> <laughs> um, I let other people do that. I could do it decently. I could do it decently. Um, I don't know how much I could sell it with, uh, if I and, and be competitive, but I can do it decently. I can make it look like stuff that's light moves with more mass than than what it has, but it's it's not something a lot of people do well. Well, and that's the balancing act for those weapons, and it, it's what makes them, I think, better NPC weapons than PC weapons. Oh, I would agree. I would. I would agree. Because you can get away with focusing more on your theatricality when you're an NPC who's, let's be honest, probably supposed to lose. Yeah, yeah. And you could, you know, do all sorts of things that make it more imposing and throw on effects when it hits and all that, all that stuff that ups the danger factor. Stuff that probably isn't available to most PCs. Yeah. Okay, so that's short pole arms. Um, peak aesthetic, performance not so much. Still, if you if I see you with a short pole arm, I I almost certainly like you. <laughs> I, I almost certainly appreciate you, um, just because I use one too. Um, okay, so long pole arms. They're good. Yeah. Um. Oh, I'll, I'll also start, start starting from a battle game perspective. I don't know why you'd take a six footer out on the battlefield unless it's some reason like an eight footer doesn't fit in my car or, you know, I live in a, I live in a cubicle. Um, and I don't want to have this thing diagonal across my room. My house is six feet by six feet. <laughs> <laughs> I, and to be honest, if it was me, I would still have it diagonally across my room. Um, <laughs> Just to have those extra two feet. Oh, yeah. Why give so, them up? It's so critical. Um, six foot works impossibly well as a skirmisher. Um, there is, the, the, in Hearthlight, the heavily armored uh, skirmisher with a six foot pole arm is is a sleeper combo. Like, Someday, some 20-something is going to figure this out, and they're going to clean house. <laughs> and I would do it, but I'm lazy now. Um, <laughs> I was I'm 20 lazy. a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, I'm lazy now, and frankly, I just draw too much attention because too many people know who I am to let me get away with this. Um, but yeah, uh, a six-foot pole arm, 
um, especially because if you get behind a line, you're, you're, you could kill on the forestroke and then you kill on the backstroke and then you throw another, you throw a cross and then you, then you come back and it's just, you're, it's just a slaughter. Um, and the fact that you could do it from six and a half feet away just makes it that much better. The ability um, to pressure shields and armor with it too is, um, it, it's something people focus too much on sometimes, I think. They they think their job is to break shields. But really, you're better off just using it as, as pressure. You're you're forcing them to calculate, this this could break my shield if I engage it the way I, I normally would. Uh, are you talking specifically about with the six-footers? No, I'm talking about long pole arms in general. Um, the six-footers, oh. I, yeah, I don't think you want to be trying to go for too many shield shots oh, oh oh i'm gonna i'm gonna disagree with that if you have an eight foot shield your job is or excuse me an eight foot pole arm your job is to break shields you can pressure that's good it's a secondary it's a secondary function but if you're on the line with that and you're not breaking shields you are you are wasting everyone's time that's true with an eight you really shouldn't be doing anything but swinging basically all the time because you're yeah. safe uh, yes, it's that's a combination of safety. Um, you chopping away with that with that pole arm, you have now created a focal point of the battle, mm -hmm. and you are drawing attention and you are pulling pressure away from everyone else. And that's part of it. You have to have the support. If you don't have the support to do this and not get ganked, like then yeah, you have to play more conservatively, and you have to you have to kind of think in terms of zones of control and you know, threatening people instead of directly acting on them. But if you can get the cover, if you have shield people who will keep you safe, you need to be attacking. Yeah, when when some orangutan with an eight foot glaive starts shouting red, 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 or heavy, 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 or whatever it is in Darkon, he he gets a lot of eyeballs. Some yeah. someone is going to take notice and you're you're going to shift the balance of what's going on. What, I mean, I'm assuming you're also breaking shields at the same time, but beyond that actual logistical benefit, people are paying more attention to you than what's going on directly in front of them. Well, it's something that, you, and especially in battle games, you have to deal with it immediately. Because if they're aggressive and they can consistently sh throw shield-breaking shots, they will fuck you up in about 30 seconds. Yeah, they're just going to carve a hole in that line and you, you can't fill it fast enough because the people no. shuffling in are just going to have that glaive raining right down in them while they're still trying to get their footing. Yeah, it's just... And it takes... And the thing is, countering it, especially if that glaive is fighting from their own line, takes a serious commitment and a serious level of organization. Because if you just do it one at a time, you're just going to get chumped by the support fighters. The glaive shield people will take you out. Yeah. Well, because once he starts peeling back the shields, I mean, the, the shield guys in front are going to start moving up and taking that that real estate. Yeah, because yeah, because usually the way this works is you're you're shoving the whole line back, and even if you're not getting those shield breaking shots, you can rely on intimidation a lot of the time. Um, and even so if it's only I... even if it's only isolated. Like it, it sounds at first like you might be making a kill pocket for yourself, but what you're doing is you're exposing two of the enemy's flanks. You're you're creating more flanks to exploit as as you carve your way in. And the thing is, they're gonna give that they're not gonna form a kill pocket. They're gonna give way in front of you. Yeah. So so yeah. Anyway, so if I see you with a, a long pole arm, and you seem competent, um, <laughs> I'm very happy to see you. Um. I'll be honest, I, I I have yelling at useless and timid polearm fighters is like my hobby. <laughs> um, it, it's the they, real reason he LARPs, is is to yell at timid polearm fighters. Um it's it's it, I take personal offense at it because uh spear and polearm are the uh the two first things I picked up and uh, honest to God, uh no, I'm probably better with spear now. There was a long time when I was better with polearm than spear, but I think at this point I've probably fought spears so, so to near exclusively for like five years that I think I'm I think I'm just better with spear. But yeah, no, I just to me they're very intuitive weapons, and they reward aggression. 
And if you're just sitting there and being timid, you are wasting a spot online. I think I've taken kids' pole arms from them and used them and started using them. Yes. No, I know you've done that. You've also taken people from the line physically and pushed them out of the way. Yes, I know that. I almost got in a fight. I almost got in a fight in the SCA over that. I did it to a duke. <laughs> he was sitting on the it was a it was a it was a broken a broken wall scenario and he was sitting on the corner and not doing fucking anything, so I just shoved in front of him. And he said, Excuse me, my lord, my hat is far too shiny to tolerate this. <laughs> <laughs> and then he argued that the SCA was not a LARP, and here we are. <laughs> so yeah, uh, if you're gonna do it, be aggressive, because uh, I like, I, I like, I like aggressive pole arms on my side. Um, but like, if you're scared of the weapon, <laughs> like, and that's the funny thing, like, you get you get some pole arm fighters who look like they're scared of their weapon. They're they're afraid to let go lest the head turn around and. And yeah, turn and on them. Strike them like it's a snake. Um, and like you, you do, it's it is something you need to practice with. Um, unless I knew I was sending, unless I knew the person was a gorilla, like, you know, unless I knew this person was just so naturally aggressive, um, I would not put a, I would not put a brand new fighter on the line with a pole arm. I put them on the line with a sword and shield. Um, that's made more user friendly. But if if unless they're unless I know this person is aggressive and I trust them reasonably enough not to just throw rampant headshots, <laughs> um, I might give them pull arm. But yeah, overall, aggressive pull arms on my team, excellent. Um, <laughs> timid pull arms, a personal offense. <laughs> Yeah, pole arms, sure. pole arms, and LARP are weird. Pole arms and LARP are really weird because, in, in a lot of them, you're not supposed to stab, which takes a a bit out of your arsenal. And then going back to the same issue with the with the leverage weapons is, you're not supposed to throw shield breaking shots either in most most LARPs. Um, yeah, um... it turns it in almost a weird sort of like. Maximum range epe fencing, I guess. Kinda. I mean, that's kind of what it feels like, especially in games where, um, as soon as a we as soon as an enemy's weapon makes contact with your swing, your swing is now inert, which is really what kills pole arms in a lot of games. Because if you can't press through on an attack, there's no reason for it to be six foot long. Well, right, and also when you're using a weapon that long, that's a lot more room for them to make incidental contact with your weapon and turn your swing into a butterfly fart. Yeah. So in a lot of games, in a lot of campaign games, they're not great. Um, if you really don't want to get, in get into combat, but you still want to kind of sort of fight, they're good for that, I guess. So like if you're, you know... If you're mostly a caster who wants to occasionally poke at things, yeah, that that given the fact that your NPCs are going to be outnumbered anyway, so they can't just run up on you, I'm um, sure go with go with a pole arm. Why not? I I will say that I in in my experience, um, and I think this is how Banshee was using it as well. The best use scenario for a pole arm in a LARP is fighting in the thirds. Oh yeah, if you use like a you you should be using it like a quarter staff. Well, not really like a quarter staff. No. Um, um, <laughs> but in the stereotypical style of a quarter staff. Yeah. I was um, gonna say I hope no one's reading George Silver at home and going aha. Excellent. <laughs> Please don't. Now I can defeat the Italians and the French. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where I can get a black for who makes a black forest bill in latex. <laughs> George Silver would love that there's a an English weapons company called Saxon Violence. Uh, <laughs> his shade is smiling at that right now. <laughs> um so yeah, as a general rule, don't follow George Silver's advice in games that you want to return to. Um 
But yeah, I've fought in both Damarung and in Exile with a staff weapon of some sort, um, fighting in the thirds. And uh, the ability to just constantly shift the direction of your attacks and still have that solid, like, six-foot defensive line, um, I find is, is really useful. And the thing is, it is a little bit unique to LARPs. I haven't sat down and thought about why, but it's not something I would ever try to do in a battle game. Well, because in a battle game, leverage matters more. Yes, I think that's probably why, because um, when, when I'm a... fighting in the thirds with my uh, with my old lance, I wasn't striking with the butt. I was only striking with the, the head. But I was still doing that same like spinning, arcing style. But when my shots came in, they were coming in at speed, but I wasn't delivering them with force, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, it does. I, I think that's the, that's the reason it wouldn't work in a battle game. You you can't you you need to generate too much power, um, and you would need to, to commit too much to not get chewed up. I think one of the other reasons is that a battle game weapon doesn't have as much usable surface area for your grip. Also true. <clears throat> also true. I've never tried fighting in the thirds in a campaign game. Um, because I think my fighting in the thirds and your fighting in the thirds don't look the same. No, no, they are probably not the same. <laughs> um, honestly, my fighting in the thirds probably looks a bit anime. Yeah. So, um, if, if, in case you don't know what fighting in the thirds is, fighting in the thirds is where on a longer weapon, you, you grip it in such a way where the weapon is divided into one third beneath your bottom hand, one third between your hands, and one third on top of your uh, upper hand, um, and that's your default defensive stance. And your your hands will slide, move back and forth. But the idea is you're bringing both ends of the weapon into play, and you usually lead with one end. But the fact that you have that open grip. Um, I mean, what I like to do a lot is I is I feint in with the top, and then I bring my bottom hand and I I slide it up, and basically I I throw an uppercut with the weapon. It's it's okay. difficult to dis to describe, but um, that was a that was a money shot for me at Exile, was uh, yeah. being being able to throw that that high feint, pull the shield out of line, and then from literally the opposite angle, like if I threw high right, the shot came from low left, um, and that that was a a good change up. Yeah, I, I I I could not fight in the thirds at most games. Um, if the game allows stabbing, I could do it. Um, but my fighting in the thirds is is fourteenth uh, and fifteenth century poleaxe work, uh, and that looks a lot different than that. And then it's very stabby. So if I can't, if I'm, it's one of those things where like if I'm even in the stance and I can't stab in the game, I shouldn't be in the stance because someone's gonna get stabbed. It's um, it's gonna happen. It's just muscle memory. Same reason you um, shouldn't use my Damarung shield because you would just straight punch someone right in the nose. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, that's why I won't use that shield. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to wreck someone's entire face with that thing. So yeah. So um, again, I I, I like pull arms and like. In LARP, because I, I I respect the aesthetic. I I rarely see a shitty looking LARP pole arm. Like they, if if someone's going out of the way to spend two hundred dollars on a LARP pole arm, and that's the minimum for a decent looking one, they've put thought into it. Yeah, they they, they so know like, what they want. So like everyone who's used the LARP pole arm in uh, that I've seen has has it's it has matched, which is funny because there's like a half dozen LARP pole arms on the market. <laughs> like and it's some the of same. them are, are very distinctive. Some of them only fit with with a few a few kits, but everyone who has them has seemed to have uh, done the legwork. Yeah, yeah. So so that's pole arms, I think. Uh, unless you have anything else. No, no, not really. Um, just that the the inability to stab makes things odd. Um, yeah, but but still not like they're not useless. Yeah. And I mean, if, um, if you really want to, you can always, like we said, maximum range epe fencing. Just, yeah. Just drop back to a normal spear stance and uh, use them that way. Yeah. Um, 
honestly, people are scared to use them as big, giant, two-handed swords. And that's that's what holds a lot of people in my back. Because if you're just grabbing it by the end and whipping it around, you can do a lot of work with it. You can, but you got to have control. And I think a lot True. of people aren't aren't confident enough in their ability to do that. Fair, um, fair. It's actually surprising because um, the way I use it, like I said, it looks a, a little bit anime. It, it's a bit like uh, like that fight from uh, Game of Thrones where, goodness, what's his name was fighting the mountain. Um, oh, Oberyn, Oberyn Martell. Yeah, and we were so worried that there would be so many uh, the Red Viper. We we're so worried that there would be so many people trying to emulate the Red Viper. I haven't seen it yet, and I'm I'm pretty glad because that's uh, it's. <laughs> takes that way would, more that control. Been, that would have been unfortunate. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that didn't that didn't take off. That the didn't way we take were, off the way we were worried it would. But yeah, I think I, I mean think I, that's I, I think that's pole I, arms. Yeah, I think so too. I was gonna say. Uh, I will say with pole arms, they're easy to look good with because you just do some Dynasty Warriors shit. Oh, yep, yeah. <laughs> and you look good because that's how I use my my uh, my ox tongue. I'm just going full on go on you with it. Um and it works. <laughs> um so just do some dynasty warrior shit and you're golden. Uh, speaking of anime pole arms. Speaking of anime okay. pole arms. Spear. Spear. Um so I guess we're really only talking about this in battle games because I have never seen an exclusive a a, a true spear. Actually no, that's a lie. Um, there's the two wyvern spears that show up uh, in Dameron, uh, which look great. Don't love the performance, but they look great. Um, but yeah, typically you don't see spears in arms because stabbing is verboten. Right. And if you can't stab, why use a spear? Why are you, what are you doing? That's, yeah, That's what it does. Spears in battle games. I am biased. Oh, Oh, do you think we're biased on spears? <laughs> I think we're a little biased on spears. Did we perhaps once hijack an entire unit and turn them all to the use of the heavy spear just because we wanted to see if it would work? It, that might have been a thing that happened. I, that I been seem to did. recall that being a I thing. Seem to recall, I seem to recall something vaguely like that happening and that that setting off a fucking talk about a butterfly fart. <laughs> <laughs> as, as I recall, that... So, the, the inciting incident is Erdok and I sitting on a hill, watching our friend Gwaith fight with a shoulder buckler, and wondering, what if that was big? This thought le- <laughs> brought on a lead weight being cast onto the rubber sheet of the East Coast meta. <laughs> East Coast meta? That, that moment is the reason there's heart light. <laughs> Which is still mostly on the East Coast, but <laughs> yeah, there's a direct there's a direct line from that moment to to Hearthlight being formed. So if you're a member of Hearthlight, uh, you can thank 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 Wade. Th- 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 thank a shoulder buckler shoulder with a buckler. smiling sun on it, because that's <laughs> that that and the Sly Fox Brewery is what you owe your origins to. <laughs> True facts. <laughs> um. But yeah, so anyway, Tycho and I are long long time spear users and um I'll be honest, I I I, I uh, spears I will say this, spears unlike shields there can be too many spears. Yes. Um because uh, even if you have even if you're in pike rig, there is a limit to how much a spear can hold ground. Uh spears are support weapons. They need to be they need assistance. They need shield fighters. Um, they really do need shield fighters. Um, without a pike shield, it's especially, especially uh, a dire need. And just to, to clarify what we say when we mean pike rig, we're talking: you're wearing body armor, you've got greaves on, you've got a helmet on, and your shield covers you from neck to knee. And you're, and you're wearing all this with a nine to ten foot spear. Yeah, you are still able to effectively use a two foot spear. Two-handed spear. Um, Two-handed, excuse me, two-handed spear, yeah. Um, so, yeah, spears, I, I have been in situations where I've gone, fuck, I've got too many spears. Um, because 
spears they, they just need the support and if any spear though the way you kill a spear is you get in you get in under the head and you're close and even if they have a sidearm you still got to do that because we're we're fairly able to defend ourselves in, in pike rig um but what we found was that the only way to really beat the pike rig was mutually assured destruction which still led to the loss of the pike rig which means that Effectively, we've been removed from the combat and can no longer have that outsized effect that such a such a unit has. Well, if you're sacrificing a shield fighter for a pike fighter, you've come out ahead. Like to kill a pike fighter. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, to take the pike off the field is more of a loss than to take a shield off the field. So when we were uh, drilling for for these encounters, and we were doing matched force on force and just about everyone died it we counted it as as a loss because if the pikes can't preserve um you know with with equal one-to-one -one shield fighters in, in close quarters that that's not a win for us yeah um so yeah even with pike rig you still got to close and the thing is now that people have seen it and know how to deal with it it's it's become way more this will extend the window you have to find help. Um, this this will not let you go toe to toe with any with any sword and shield fighter who knows what they're doing. Um, you'll chump newbies. You'll chump people who are unfamiliar with it. Um, you might get lucky um, and you might be able to chump someone who's you know just in a general brawl. But if if they're targeting you, if they're coming at you, and they have an idea of how to handle you which is stay at mid range um, and just throw shots. Um, you, you all, all the pike rig does is buy you a few more seconds to get help, which matters a lot. Um, because if you just have a spear, they'll, they just erase you. But yeah, so spears generally, generally I love seeing spears on my team in a, uh, in a battle game. You could almost predict a victor um, based on who has more spears. Oh, that was always great at the night fighting, um, hearing the constant complaints from one side and then the other as guys with spears <laughs> would switch sides. Yeah. That was just every, every round, every single round. Someone was upset. Just, that's night fighting, though. <laughs> well, yeah. What did you, well, what they expected was two lines of guys with... 32 inch round shields and quick tubes and then just a general melee would ensue but people with other weapons want to practice at night sometimes too and when too many spears showed up people would start to leave i think i think some people got annoyed with us last time we went to bellum uh for exactly that oh because we were stepping into like fights where they did not want spears well, I went try hard mode for night fighting. I didn't go I night fighting, but I do know that people were upset with us during I forget what it was. It was where I it was the round where I gassed out. Because it was our first day back fighting. It was hot. Bellum's always way hotter than like the week leading up to it. And I gassed out after like two fights and I sat and kinda watched the third one. You remember I, I would just kinda sat there in my plate. Yeah. Um and yeah, people were upset with you. <laughs> 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 good be mad <laughs> that's why we're here we, um, we aim to please we also aim for the pelvic girdle but we aim to yeah. please <laughs> uh, but yeah it, it does you know you can have too many spears but general, like generally if you have if a third of your force is spears you're in a good place if all those spears are pikes, you can kick it up to maybe one for one pike to pike to sword and shield. Um, I might actually, you know what? I think if it were if it were me, I would want like <clears throat> if it was me designing a force, I would say eighty percent sword, uh, sword and shield pike mixed, where it's a one to one, and that eighty percent, and then twenty percent pure sword and board, just because that. That's just so versatile. You want that reaction force. Mm hmm Yep. Want that reaction force. Th throw in some archers for seasoning. Yeah. 
I mean, the whole thing is going to be moving so fast. You know, you know how you know how I lead anyway. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not even can... going to get into the, the the different ways that you have to to adapt when you're arching when we get to archery, because that that's a whole thing on its own. Yeah, but uh, unless you can shoot on the run, just get a sword and shield and get in line. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. honestly, because if, if most people are carrying what four arrows, you're not going to get four kills most of the time. I, I I don't know. I don't know. I don't pay attention. Yeah, I'm busy. I'm I'm busy moving forward. Um, I trust my archers know what to do. I now, trust if you have a bow, you 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 know what to do with it, and I don't need to give you instruction. Now, when we say spear, we're talking eight foot and up. Um, yes. Lances come under the weird shit category. Um, so let's talk about weird shit. Let's talk about weird shit, because spears didn't take much. Spears are straightforward. We don't even need to talk about them in the context of, of LARP, like campaign LARPs, because they don't exist. But a weird shit. Weird shit. Um, weird shit. Um... So I would like to divide this into two categories. Okay. Weird shit and weed shit. If sure. you have a if you have a fucking keyblade. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know? I haven't seen too many keyblades. But uh, I I do know in college, um one of my fighters made two of them. He did not use them at the same time. Or wait, he may have made one and one of his friends made the other. I do know that at some point in time, my arsenal contained a pair of uh, DAG legal keyblades. That was a thing. Oh, they were a thing for a while. They were a thing for a while. Um, speaking of weird shit, some kid out of New York apparently made a made a scythe. Um, an actual, like, uh, al allegedly... <laughs> allegedly um passes a hearth light weapon check scythe. Huh. Yeah. Um and I'm saying allegedly because because we haven't tested it. We haven't tested it, yeah. Um but I mean New York is pretty good. Like they probably gave it a good test. They they've been through enough of our shit that yeah. they know what they know what they're they know what we're looking what people are looking for. So like that's where it's normally I would just be like okay they BS this this thing through weapons check, but because it's people I know and I I, I trust I'm like huh okay we're gonna have to see this looking forward to it yeah um it looks it looks pretty neat um and I actually know there are ways to do it safely to bond fiberglass to fiberglass um. <laughs> But weird shit. So, um, so yeah, weird shit is just eccentric shit. And to be honest, um, how I feel about your weird shit depends ex on, entirely on how good your weird shit looks. Are we including flails and weird shit? No. No. Okay. Uh, not battle game flails. You want to include LARP flails and weird shit? That's that's weird shit. But a battle game flail is just okay. I'll do flail real, flail real quick. Battle game flail. You want to rack up that KDA? Hold <laughs> up. Full stop. That's it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Looking to juke those stats. So uh, yeah, flails for for campaign larps. Uh, we could kind of do it with one category because weird shit almost never works. It almost never works right. Never it's works. Almost always... Do you mean never works well or never works how it's intended? Never works well. Like, you know you're not there. You know you're not there to compete, which I appreciate. Um, but I, I, I like it. I honestly like it. It, it, it adds flavor. Um, you know what I like? The, uh, the claw weapons that Exile has. Those are... Yeah, those are interesting. Those are actually really interesting. Um, they're they're a little bit frustrating to fight against because it basically <laughs> turns like th they take up a lot of real estate. They're big. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. And and Exile is one of those games where if your if your sword touches theirs, your your sword turns to mist. 
Yeah. Um, but apart from that, like, I don't a lot. Most other games, their monsters with claws or whatever, just use like a pair of drumsticks. Yeah, like uh, like Dead Legends. Dead Legends uses brawlers, drumsticks. Brawlers are just drumsticks. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And, and no, it's cool it, that they're actually claws. You're, you're right. That is, yeah. They are kind of neat. They're kind of fun to play with, too. Yep. Yeah, I've used them... Uh, I think I've used them before as like a, almost as a parrying device. I think one time we had to be like water monsters of some sort, and I had like a pool noodle in one hand and a claw in the other, and it was it was kind of broken. Um, <laughs> like, speaking, you, of, speaking of weird shit, um, whapping people with pool noodles at Exile is... <laughs> Is, is a joyful experience because they're fucking pool noodles. So who cares? Swing yeah. it as hard as you want. It's a pool noodle. Oh, I, I like to get that little, uh, like to almost whip them so that they arc and hit like point first. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and and that's the thing. They're they're impossible to parry. There's a lot more technique to pool noodles than you would think at first glance. It's like, ah, oh, um, look at those guys hitting each other with pool noodles. There's a science to pool noodles. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say there is there is some thought, but no, the pool noodles are awesome. But the um, so these claws that we're talking about, uh, they're they're cored with three pieces of PVC, um, almost set up in like Wolverine configuration, um, and there's a frame that goes on the wrist and hand, and there's a handle. Um, that you grab onto and this kind of latches onto your frame. So if you've ever played Street Fighter and uh, you looked at Vega's claws, that's kind of what, what these are like, except PVC. Um, so they're a hoot. They're yeah. fun. <laughs> um, I've, I've never seen anything like them anywhere else, I don't think. No, uh, no, you really haven't. Um, and even in games that we haven't been to where I've read their rules... They even say that if if you're using claws or or if you're punching people, then you use the beaters. Um, so like I, and, unless they're wildly out of line with their rule book, most of these other games, they're if a wolf jumps on you, he's got a pair of drumsticks. If the claw beast from the black swamp jumps on you, he's got a pair of drumsticks. Um, so yeah, the, the, the exile claws, definitely uh, definitely an experience. Yeah, they're fun, and they're fun to fight against. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause like, cause it's such a unique weapon. Um, it's 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 a very different fight than a standard LARP fight, like it would be if someone has a set of beaters. Um, yeah, you yeah. Know. Be- beaters you can take apart. Like, yeah, if you're using a real weapon, uh, you can almost always just because they're always short. Yeah, and, you know. It's a it's a it's a campaign LARP. So well, Dead Legends actually, I would say in Dead Legends, depending on who you're, depending on who the werewolf is, <laughs> <laughs> depending on which werewolf you're dealing with, because uh, there are some that will absolutely just jump on you and maul the shit out of you, um, <laughs> um, especially if they know you. Um, but yeah, most games they're kind of worthless. Actually, the other reason they're they're better in Dead Legends is because I am one of maybe two people in town with a weapon longer than, you know, twenty inches. Yeah, yeah, I think you and I, you, you, me, and Say are the only ones that have. Oh, uh, got Minion does, Gaio does. Yeah, because the first time we played, I got attacked by a werewolf on the first night, and they didn't touch me because I I had like a a, a forty two or no, I was using the cutlass, so it's still like a forty inch. Uh, you know, single stick, and I'm decent with a single stick, and you've got a pair of 18 inch drumsticks. You're really not going to get near me unless I do something really foolish. Oh yeah, oh we had a blast just kiting that kiting that one werewolf around town. <laughs> that was great. Uh, that was one of the one of my favorite Dead Legends experiences. Just 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 playing chicken with this werewolf, and the thing is, in Dead Legends. One of the great things about Dead Legends is all the characters are so fragile. If this thing got a hold of us, we were screwed. Like, this thing would just rip us to pieces. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we were just kiting it around with the, because, and I had my, uh, I think I had the, I think I had the saber. So 36, 38 inches, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, you're not going to get near me. And I could backpedal like a motherfucker. Now, now imagine if Dead Legends werewolves had exile claws. 
Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> no, that just That's that's a no from me, gang. Yeah. Um so <laughs> so so weird shit can be a lot of fun. Um like I said, I, I as long as you're selling it, as long as you are really into your weird shit. Because here's the thing, all LARP weapons are funny state funny shaped sticks fundamentally either it's a long funny shaped stick or it's a short funny shaped stick like they all op- they are all operating on the same rules they're not actually different it's not like you know metal and wood weapons where you know profiles and balance really matters that much they're all sticks um so with weird weapons if you're into this idea that you are holding this thing you are fighting with this thing whatever it is um uh, the, you know, I like it. It's it's flavor. It's cool. Um, and even if it's not super effective, because you're not trying to be super, like you're not advertising that you're going to beat the world with this thing. You're like, I'm here to do something interesting, and I'm going to do it. And Godspeed. I, I appreciate that. I think that's an important thing to bring up, because for the longest time, every week or so, there was someone on a forum somewhere saying, Hey, so I just had this great idea for a weapon that I think will work better than every other weapon that exists currently. Uh, what does everyone think? We think you're dumb because you're wrong. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that question came up a lot back back in the day. Oh yeah, it was always like it was always someone who thought they they were gonna out clever the universe, and every newbie does it. Every newbie does it. Um, actually, a lot less now because I think a lot more people are just buying their weapons in the battle game community. Yeah, and uh, and I think if I think because because that has become the standard instead of sitting in your basement soaked soaked in dap fumes. <laughs> no dap <laughs> walrus. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> concocting bad ideas, and you know. What? Oh, hold on. I'm stepping away for a second. Not a problem. Um, yeah, there's plenty of other weapons that fall into the weird shit category too, but you're hardly ever going to come up with with that idea for the weapon that's going to change the the face of the game. I mean, people have been swinging sticks at each other since there have been people and sticks. So the the idea that you in the year 2020 have just come upon a brand new and exciting way to swing sticks that is going to dazzle everyone else in the sport or game or LARP who has uh, been swinging sticks all this time. Maybe they just didn't see it. They didn't see the nose in front of them and you're going to show them their... No, you're not going to show them their nose. They, they know where their nose is. Some weapons in this category... Um, are mostly in this category because they don't fit well in others. We mentioned the lance earlier. A lance is just my uh, my term for a short spear. Um, based on how how lances were used commonly in the Hundred Years' War, they would be cut down and used as uh, as foot weapons. So I I use a six foot lance and have used um, six foot spears before in the past. They're fun. Uh, I don't have the reach of my nine footer, but I can you know use it a little quicker. Um, yeah, I can't hold the same kind of real estate on the, on the line as I would with my normal spear, but it's there. It's fun. Uh, it's, I, I like to use it for LARPs when I'm exploring them. Like if I'm going to a LARP for the first time, I'll bring this in case I feel like using a, a reach weapon of some sort, just because it's not very intimidating. My lance is very lightly built. It doesn't look scary. It doesn't look like, uh, one of the thug weapons from the battle days, so I can usually show up to most games with with the lance, and you know, people are the lance. The lance is a fun weapon. It's so fun, and you could be an asshole with it too. That's the thing that most people don't realize. <laughs> Dirty you spear be a, tricks. You could be a major jerk with the lance. I mean, are you talking about the the plastic? The, not the plastic one. The um. The Alric ones or yeah. the uh, Banshuffle ones? Okay, the, yeah, Alric, the Alric ones, ones. Are, they're a little more limited because they break. Uh, mine's been good so far, but e- even the Banshop lances are, are still pretty good fun. Oh, um, no, they're, they're great. 
they actually work really well for the uh the spear and sword combo that we discussed last time oh yeah oh yeah because the mass of it uh is helpful for keeping that spear on point or the point uh the point of the spear online but yeah so uh, like with weird shit as long as you're not expecting to beat the world with it and you're not going to act salty if you just kind of don't do very well and you're you're into the weird shit like you're leaning into it i think they're a lot of fun I was, as long as I, sorry I, go ahead i was thinking maybe throwing weapons count as weird shit but i think we'll talk about them when we get to archery i think that makes a bit yeah. more sense we'll just wrap this up with all the ranged weapons in one category oh so one last thing with weird shit, weird shit. um if you are if you are taking weird shit from a directly from another source like um you decide that you need to commission a weapon that looks like that thing that Ray used at the end of uh, Evangelion when it's that big double-sided polearm thing. If this is a direct call out to a show or a movie or anything like that, don't. Just don't. 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 It's not cool most of the time. Like, if it doesn't fall into one of the other categories, that's the other thing. If it doesn't fall into the one, uh, one of the other categories, you want to get a, a replica of Narsil to use in a LARP, knock yourself out. I don't care. Um, if you're going to pick, like, a bat left. Yeah. Don't. <laughs> and we're not in space, especially. Don't. Um, yeah, just, if so, if it's in anime, don't, um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so, all right, so let's go on to, to ranged weapons. Bows are probably the most common. Yeah. I, I should have oh, said yeah. probably, bows, bows are the most common. Um, um, so it's, 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 it's interesting because in a lot of campaign LARPs, bows kind of seed their place through spell casting. Yes. Uh, and a lot of times actual bows are not allowed. Um, and the other thing is because of the way hit points work, um, bows, bows are at a big disadvantage towards just versus just chucking packets like actual bows where you have to draw it, put an arrow to string. Um, you could spam packets way faster and way easier than you could spam arrows. And you can carry way more packets too, because like I can throw on a satchel and have a hundred packets ready to go, but I don't think I've ever carried more than ten arrows at a time, and that was pushing it. Yeah, that was um, like with my quiver was full. I had a couple in my belt, and I had a few in my bow hand. Like that was yeah. ma maximum overload. So, so for most games, most campaign larps, physical bows are not worth it at all. Um, and it would be different if there was something. It was there, if there was something like some huge alpha strike damage that archers could do at like long range. Like if I wanted to make a bow a viable weapon in like a Nero clone tarp type LARP or like an exile type LARP, I would do it by making them the supreme long range weapon. Uh, but then you'd have to deal with the fact that if it's up close, what are you going to do then when the person is throwing out huge amounts, huge numbers? But anyway, um, most campaign games don't use bows for a bunch of reasons. Um, they're actually really good in Damron and uh, Malleus with the new rules because they've made people a lot less durable. Um, I have a feeling that Damron and Malleus are going to be dominated by throwing weapons this season. We, we set a good example. Well, even 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 more than the example we set, because the thing is, I don't think we won enough. We you don't. I don't think we won enough engagements for people to notice. That's true. We did well with them, but we weren't winning battles just because of the numbers. We did talk uh, we about were, it a lot too. But, yeah, uh, not outside the faction, but I think because you know, so last season in Damron, um human players could cap out with eight or nine hit points and trolls could hit 11 or 12. Um, 
in this season where effectively you have three hit points. So um, helmet, the first in these games, um, they let you take another, having a certain type of helmet will let you take an extra point of damage. So helmet, wounded, down. And then usually there's a perk. So four hits before you're down. Um, so taking a hit from an arrow on the way in has dropped you to 25, 25% health. That's a big, steep drop. And the thing is, arrows, throwing axes, throwing knives, anything, they all chunk you for a pretty good amount of damage. So that's a fight changer. That's a game changer. We, we held off, the two of us held off uh, six people because I had four axes, Ray had two, and that threat... And the fact that we were actually hurting them with them held them off long enough for uh, our runner to come back with Ray's shield and let him set up in uh, King Tiger mode. <laughs> and since uh, they didn't have a uh, a typhoon loaded with rockets, well, they were kind of out of luck. Yeah, um, that was the demonstration of the of, of long long sword and big shield and how good it is in most games. Because, oh lord, it is good in most games. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, yeah, and that was, with, that was with those people probably having between three to five hit points each. Mm. So, so, well, yeah, so that's, that will be an equivalent of any fight in Season 2, because it's about the same. Uh, three to five hits to drop you. So, yeah, that, that kind of shows how effective how effective they were that we were able to stand them off like that. But uh, yeah, if it's, if you're in a game where it's low hit points, then throwing, you're throwing and projectile weapons come into their own. They really do. Um, so battle games, let's talk about battle games. Since battle games generally do have that high level of, of lethality with it only taking one or two hits max to kill you. Yeah, bows are bows are great. And actually this this leads into you may remember back when we were talking about shields, I mentioned a, a bow story and uh I didn't mention it again in pole arms, but it could have come up again in pole arms. Because once upon a time we were at Ragnarok. It was uh the one time when I got a bunch of my friends from college to go. So there were there were several of us there who all knew each other. And uh our friend had a guy come up and start hitting on her. He said, "Yeah, I'm I'm really good at this. I'm I'm great. You sh- you should watch me fight." He's like, "Yeah, well, I'm I'm here with my friends over there." He's like, "Oh, is, are those your friends there?" She said, "Yeah." He said, "Cool. I'm gonna kill all them so you can see how good I am." So she told us this. Um, unfortunately for him, he had a glaive, a karate g, a catcher's helmet, and a pair of hockey gloves. We had about two dozen arrows and four bows between us. He didn't actually get to the line, ever. We didn't allow him to get more than 10 feet from the spawn point. After about the sixth time we killed him, he threw his glaive and left the field. That's awesome. Did you make... <laughs> so, wait, uh, did you make Mike the Samurai quit? No, it wasn't did Mike the Samurai. Mike the... It, was, it was a different guy who looked just like Mike the Samurai. <laughs> oh, wait, no, this guy didn't have the catcher's helmet. No, he just had the hockey <laughs> gloves and the glaive and the, and the, the white karate G. But okay, yeah, because the second you said catcher's helmet, I'm like, Mike the Samurai? No, no. I, I misplaced the catcher's helmet in my brain. This guy did not have a catcher's helmet, but he did have a bad day because he threatened to kill all of the people this person knew. And she told us that. And I don't think he realized that it's a long way to the line of combat when there's four people spread across the line waiting to shoot you in the face. <laughs> uh, and, that's good. And you know, at the very least... Susan and myself are very good shots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. <sighs> so, bows. So, well, here's the thing about bows. Bows are bows are a very all or nothing prospect. Getting good at using a bow in a battle game is is an all or nothing thing. Um you have to really commit to it because it's very different than arching in a uh, in a target archery or even a 
hunting archery capacity. Um, the gear is different. The conditions are different. The, you know, the expectations are different. Um, you know, you're going from something that is generally a fairly placid, planned sort of thing. Like, I don't know many good archers who rush shots, whether they're hunters or target shooting. I, I used to shoot competitively, and I cannot remember ever having to throw down my bow in the midst of a of a of a uh, of a set and engage someone in a fist fight before immediately picking my bow back up and firing again. Yeah, you're not you're not people don't run archery like John Wick CQB style drill. <laughs> um, Damn it! That's something else I want to do now. <laughs> <laughs> um. The Legolas made a lot of people think that that was real easy to do. I will say that Legolas made a lot of disappointed, disappointing, disappointed LARP archers for a few years. You could have said disappointing too. You would have been right. <laughs> but yeah, um, so it is a very un- arching in a battle game is a very unique set of skills, and not a lot of people develop it. But the ones who do, goddamn, look the fuck out. You have you have to build scenarios around them. They are just that dominant on the field. And there's so many ways to do it, too. I mean... There's a few that work a lot better. Well, there's a hierarchy of ways. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so the, the, the lowest tier in this hierarchy is the traditional backfield archer. Um, this is an archer who... Well, and well, we were talking before we get into archer stories. Um, so basically, I when I see an archer on the field, I'm going to evaluate you the first time you take a shot at somebody. I'm going to decide if you're either, uh, you know, the eighty percent that are people with bows, who you'll make you you'll probably get lucky a couple times during the day, but you're not really going to dramatically alter the scenario. And then there's archers, and archers are problems. So our archers are the ones where if you're on my team, I love you. If you're on the other team, you go die. <laughs> <laughs> Fall in a hole. Don't crawl out. Literally, because I'm going to assign my my most aggressive, angriest fighter to to spend their entire day making your life a living hell. Garcia was great for this. Garcia was amazing for this. Heiner wasn't bad at it either, but he was also the problem. <laughs> Heiner was Heiner. Heiner is a is, is the he is the entire pinnacle tier of archery, uh, and we'll get into that. But uh, but yeah. So anyway, either you suck and I don't care, or you're actually good. And the, so the bottom tier is generally backfield archers. These people are really irritating at their commanders too. If they've got a field presence. Um, and they can arch from the back line. Um, OLB was good for this. Um, and Markland, the Lost Boys, were every one of their every one of their commanders was a crack shot with a bow too. It was infuriating. This was what I did with the Rogan before we trained them for Pike. Um, was I I ran the skirmishers, and so I was running mostly light fighters and other archers as an archer and uh yeah it it works um so yeah so if they're if they are a backfield archer and they are commanding they are they are that is a very 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 dangerous uh enemy if they're good at both the jobs um but you also get a lot of them where they they're just decent archers who sit in the backfield these are your lazy archers. These are the ones who just want to sit in one place and not go anywhere and just have, you know, 19 year olds bring them arrows back. <laughs> just, just farm headshots, pad your KDA out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they're, they're good. They're, they're very good. They're very useful. Um, they're not really mobile enough to really, really be dynamic. You can work around them. Um, they're easy to deal with because you can pull the fight away from them 
and make them reposition themselves and catch them while they're re repositioning. Because normally, normally if you're doing this, you're not going to be one of the one of the people who, who turns it into a running fight. They'll either have a backup weapon and try to duel you, or they'll just call it dead when you get within ten feet. Um, so that's them. The next one is you have your aggressive frontline archers, and these are the people that I adore. I adore my pocket archers. I adore the archers who will shove themselves over my shoulder to take a shot into the front line from like five feet away. God bless you. Spastic comes to mind immediately. This is how Spastic fights. Spastic does that. Sousa does that too. He he practiced actually like being able to fire on the deflection so he could hold the bow up and not actually be aiming down the arrow and just fire and hit the target anyway. <laughs> Like per you do per this periscope too. shooting. Um, if you're not commanding, you do this too. Yes. Um, pocket archers, if you don't know, is when an archer um, teams up with a a heavily armored shield person who's using a large shield, um, and basically the uh, the uh, the shield person drags the archer around the field, and you could actually have a you usually have one you. There's always one person commanding the pair, and depending on who does it, it's the shield person or the archer. I I think the shield person does better. I think it's better to have the archer focusing on being an archer, and the shield person needs to have the field awareness anyway. Um so I think that I think it's I think it generally works better with the shield the shield lead rather than the archer lead. And then the shield is just calling out targets for the archer. Um, and the archer is taking them from the relative safety of being behind the shield and the shield person. I I also think it works better with the shield commanding because that frees my attention up to focus on counter battery. So since I'm not worried about like how we're going to get where we're going or where I think we should go, um, I'm free to devote my attention to following the person driving and making sure that anyone who is looking at us gets shot. Um, yeah. Because that's the other, that's the other duty of a pocket archer is dedicated counter battery. If someone's drawing a bead on your shield, you need to stop that archer. And if they're aiming at your shield, you probably have a clean shot. Um, one of the things that a lot of uh, people with bows do is they tunnel really, really hard. Um, and I've I've shot a lot of people at an angle because they were staring at their target and didn't realize that I had just drawn up and shot them before they could let go of their arrow. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, and, uh, and the thing is being attached to the shield person makes that counter battery easier because, um, the shield person is, uh, the shield person will be able to get the archer into, uh, into good angles, uh, on especially backline archers. Um, so yeah, so, um, frontline archers tend to do a lot of counter battery. Um, if there are good archers on both sides, whoever, <laughs> the priority of both sides needs to be establishing archer superiority. If you can suppress the other side's archers, you've won. Nine times out of 10. Archery fits no. in the same sort of role as, as spears in that sense, and that, um, you can definitely have too many, but having more is usually good. Like having more than yeah. the other team is, is usually good. Yeah, well, you you can have too many people with bows. That's true. I'm not sure you could have too many archers. I'm not sure there's enough archers, there's enough archers to archers have. In the game. <laughs> you, you can't mathematically reach that point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, it just might not be... I was talking on a theoretical level. Theoretically, if we had a game full of, of Heiners and, and Suzes and, and me, then uh, yeah, you, you could have a lot of archers on one, on one team and not have it be that much of a detriment. But if you had a lot of uh, Jim from accounting who decided to see what this LARP stuff was all about and his buddy Carl let him borrow a bow... You can definitely have too many of that guy. You you can or, easily. Or, or the classic, um, the classic mundane boyfriend or girlfriend or partner uh, yes. who has never done this before. The significant but, um, archer. 
the significant archer, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, that they're, 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 uh, those people, and I feel bad because it's like it's the shittiest way to get. Well, some people enjoy themselves, but for the most people, it's, it's the shittiest way to get introduced to a hobby. Uh, well, having your significant having a, your significant other hand you something and abandon you to your fate. <laughs> And it's feast or famine, too, because if, if you're not an experienced archer, which if you're a significant archer, you probably aren't, um, you're, you're not going to get too many hits. And if you do, you're going to be like, hey, I, I got somebody. But once you've got a hit, now people know you exist. And someone's <laughs> going to come along and ruin your day. Yeah, I was going to say, you've now lit up the threat radar of every skirmisher on the field. <laughs> <laughs> because guess what? Significant archers usually don't carry sidearms, and if they do, they almost never know how to get them out in time. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so TLDR, if you're going to bring a significant other to a battle game, get them a shield, for God's sake. Give them a sword and shield, because honestly, it, it comes down to the classic X-Wing versus TIE fighter. X-Wing pilots got better because they had shields and managed to live through more than one dogfight. Yeah, um... If if you live longer, you can learn more, and the shield helps with that so much. <laughs> and I don't care how many archer themed things they've watched or done or seen in video games. It's different. It's very different. The funniest thing is watching someone who's good at target archery get fucking super mad. <laughs> I I don't know. Did you know that uh, Denise was a a college a college competitive archer and very good at it? I did not. Can you imagine what Bill went through introducing her to combat lar- to combat archery? I can. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Poor Bill. Poor Bill. <laughs> um to give some context to this, this is our friend Bill and Denise and um Denise when she joined uh the SCA for the first time um took the title of La Bespetica, which is the shrew in Italian. And it's a title she holds with honor, and it fits. Uh, so, God bless you, Billy. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, yeah. So, um, anyway. So, we're discussing pocket archers. Yeah, pocket archers, um, frontline archers generally. Because they don't need to be pocket archers. That's true. Smart, smart experienced frontline archers who can do their own thing are very helpful and they just kind of pop in and pop out where they make the most, where they do the, where they make a big impact. Um, Cause I can pocket, but mostly I only pocket usually with you. And usually if we have the whole household on the field for a specific battle, like if, yeah. if we're not both on the field, then I hardly ever pocketing. I'm usually just drifting the front. Yeah. Um, and, well, and pocketing is very focused and it's very objective driven and it's yeah. not it's not always the most appropriate thing um it's a good thing it's a good thing to do if you are on a field that you don't know and you don't trust anyone else around you to not be an idiot because it's you and your teammate it's you and someone you know it's you and someone who you can predict and you will just be act as force multipliers to each other uh, but if, if for the most part people are being reasonable, you know, there isn't always an advantage to being that focused. Um, I actually think a, a roving archer would would be better in a lot of circumstances just because they can react faster. Yeah, and they might not be as as tied to uh, to pursuing certain objectives as the the shield and bow combo would be. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so that's the that's kind of the second the second tier of archers that. That frontline archer, and they are, they are, they are the ones that you sit up and take notice. Um, they will, they will, cha- they will shape a game. These people will. Um, these are the ones that will smash open a a, a kill pocket or a uh, or take a gate. Um, gates are taken with ten foot arrows, ten foot arrow shots to the face. <laughs> And sometimes even just the threat of an arrow shot, because I know at the at the last uh, battle of Leeds, um, Susan and I were were fighting together. He had his bow, I had my longsword, and we came up 
on a heavily armored shield fighter who was defending a healer. And uh, Souza just raised his bow, took aim, and as soon as that shield moved in line to try and stop the arrow that they thought was coming, I tore them in half. <laughs> <laughs> that that shield moved just enough that I got them three times in the ribs before they could readjust. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, there is a lot to be said for the psychological impact of someone who repeatedly gets these short-range kills that are not usually pleasant for the person who's getting pinged with an arrow. Because every motherfucker who fights front frontline archery shoots for the face. <laughs> Y'all do it. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Y'all do it. Whiplash made videos of it. <laughs> <laughs> If he could put GoPros on his arrow shafts, he would. <laughs> I have no doubt in my mind that he would. And and frankly, frankly, it makes perfect sense to do it because it is open on most people and it has a big psychological impact. Taking an arrow to the kisser is not pleasant. Oh my god, I remember uh, at the first Damron game, I took an arrow to the uh, tusks. Oh, I domed somebody at, at Damarung, and uh, I, I think you're not supposed to shoot people in the head there. But no, you're not. I you're, had, you're, you're not. Well, it wasn't on purpose. I had picked up one of the, like, the the shiny, like, dome-headed LARP arrows. Oh, no. And I took direct <laughs> aim for center mass. Would have been a perfect shot if I was using my arrow, which probably weighs, like, several ounces more <laughs> than, than these LARP arrows. And as soon as I let the arrow go and felt how fast it left the bow, I thought, oops. <laughs> and that shot that was going straight for the clavicle with, or not clav clavicle, straight for the sternum with any other arrow, right dead center in the forehead. Oof. And the person like reeled and fell down as though struck from on high. And I checked, but they were just LARPing. Oh, um, uh, okay. <laughs> I was re really concerned. Cause like, oh, wait, I think we're not supposed to do that here. And they just collapse like a dead tree. Um... Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it, it happens. You're, sure, it you're, happens. You're playing, you're playing with physics. It happens. And I mean, I, I, uh, the first time I ever shot a horse bow, as opposed to one of my, my old like traditional recurves or, or a long bow, the first time I shot a horse bow, the mechanical efficiency differential was such that I had the exact same thing happen. I shot at Peacemaker and knocked his hat off. <laughs> I was not aiming for Peacemaker's hat. If I had been firing any other bow, I would have hit him in the chest. But I, it was my first time picking up a horse bow. I was like, let's see what this is about. And I have used almost nothing but horse bows since then. <laughs> <laughs> and then headshots against Peacemaker don't count anyway. <laughs> Peacemaker has thrown so many headshots against so many people that you could just sit and smack him in the dome for all eternity. Well, and, and it was it was Dag, so I, I was allowed to hit him in the head anyway. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. But even if I wasn't, wouldn't have felt bad. <laughs> Fuck that guy. <laughs> I remember me and Minnie taking over under bets on how many on how many headshots he'd throw in each tournament fight. Who won? I did. Because you bet high. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think mini bet at three and I bet five, and I think it was at four. And this is this this is a standard. This is a standard. This isn't anything special either. This is just a standard up and down <laughs> fight. Uh, so yeah, so um, so yeah, there is a psychological element to that uh to battle game close range archery because it is not pleasant to be hit and to be hit with a bow or to be, to be hit with an arrow uh, and especially not to be hit in the face even if you're in armor i mean if it is my body in armor i don't give a shit yeah. uh but I mean, we, and so now we've hit each ahead. other with which must much worse on on the armored <laughs> body than the larp yeah. arrows um so now we move on to the 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 worst slash greatest archer uh, or archer archetype. And this is, this is kind of the pinnacle. And these, these guys you want on your team because, Oh Lord, do they have an outsized effect on the field? This is a fighter who combines mobility, 
skill with a bow and the ability to fight and to fight hand to hand and and almost always it's kind of a requirement insane tactical awareness yeah you can't just, you can't do this if you tunnel vision just unreal levels of knowing where everyone is all the time um it's not unreal because if you pay attention to where they go if you're skirting the edge of the field it's a lot easier to keep track of things sure and they're only engaging when they choose to engage so they're making themselves vulnerable for very short periods um but that is still good it is still good field awareness but you don't need to be you know almost prescient levels of field awareness to pull this off no um, it, it just seems like it to people who think oh that guy's alone i can sneak up on him yeah no he's he, he's they expect it and they're they've already tracked you if, so you're, like, you if you're basil it's actually your main reason for existing <laughs> There's a there's a variant of this class that's called the trap archer, <laughs> where they have a bow that's primarily for decoration because they're a lousy shot. It's to make you think it's safe to rush them. But yes, that's the, that's the entire the entire goal to to make you think it's safe to rush them, and then they beat the living daylights out of you. It's like an angler fish, but instead of a, <laughs> a glowing lure, it's a ten dollar bow from either Walmart or India. I'm not sure which, <laughs> but uh. Yeah. Stolen from the Boy Scout camp. <laughs> no, it's from garage sale. It's from a garage sale, and uh, no, the the uh, <laughs> the Boy Scout camp is where he got the foam. He cut them out of of their uh, canoe seat cushions, and that's where the arrows are from. <laughs> um. So yeah, that it, and and these guys always have janky archer builds because it doesn't matter. Their gear at your gear doesn't matter. It's just there. It's just there to get your attention and to get you close enough for them to stab the shit out of you. <laughs> so that is a subtype of that. Look out for them. They will embarrass you. <laughs> they're not really game. Ch- they're not really changing anything. Anything. They're you know. You're you're better off letting him keep shooting. Honestly, don't yeah. don't try to shut him down. It, it's not better for you that way. <laughs> it's not going to work out for you. You're just giving him what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so if they are, if, if these if these folks are actually good at using a bow and actually can fight and actually have the gas tank to stay mobile, um, these are the guys that will will take on five to one odds and win. These these are the guys who will collapse a whole flank on their own. Um, and the worst part is there is almost no good counter. Kind of the only good counter is to be an equally good example of the same archetype. Yeah, there. I mean, you don't you don't beat them one to one. No. You you need to have people who are fast enough to cut off the corners on them and not and basically box them in and then just mop them. People who are fast enough to not get strung out and isolated because as soon as one of you gets, you know, four paces ahead of the other. They stop running yeah. away, chump the first guy, and now it's just another one-on-one fight, which they just won a one-on-one fight. And, and not going to lose this one. <laughs> all they need to do is just leg you. Yeah. Because once they leg you, they're free to do whatever they want to do anyway. Go ten paces away, turn around, and uh, fit mm-hmm. you for some dental hardware. <laughs> but yeah, so um, so people who could do that, oh my gosh. Um, instant respect on the field, because... If you're fighting against them, you are now you you have now you now have to alter your entire strategy to factor into this to factor this person in. Um, and honestly, the, a lot of times this is one of those situations where, and this is kind of a universal thing. If you find yourself with a disadvantage in archers, um, it's best just to try and end things as quick as possible. Because the one problem that archers have is that they they have trouble having a sustained effect. Because if you if they're not able to get more arrows, they're gonna they're gonna run out of effect. They're gonna run out of uh, ways to affect the battle. And um, they <clears throat> it's not as quick as with other weapon systems, like. You can't pile bodies with a with a bow like you can with a spear. 
Yeah. I, I, can, I... I can fire 12 aimed shots a minute. I can throw way more spear thrusts. Yeah, I was going to say, if, if I get in an inflating position with my spear, I, I, I can wipe out six people in two to three seconds. Um, you can't do that with a bow and arrow. Yeah. Um, you know, if a, sword's, if a sword person makes a breakthrough, they could sit there and just bah, 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 bah. Uh, just drum rolling the line. Um, you can't do that with an archer. So you, so you, you know, the the real way to to or the best way to deal with an archer disadvantage is just just force the engagements, just maximum aggression, um, and just try and bully your way through. And it works you know, better than most things. Yeah, because over, over time, the team with more archers, the, the longer the archers have to operate, the more of an effect they'll have. Yeah. Because uh -huh. there's an upper limit on their literal rate of fire. Yep. Yeah, so you denied denying the archers chances to to sit there and work <clears throat> is uh is really important. This is actually um it's actually one of the reasons I, I started, you know, moving my forces so fast. Um, because it nullifies archery to a good, to a big effect. Um, it, it nullifies those losses you take when having that staring contest. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so that's archery. And, uh, I think that's about it. I don't, I don't know. I don't have anything else to say really. Just that throwing weapons don't really do much in battle games except the odd javelin. Um, too many shields. Too, too many, many shields. shields. Um, but they're they're great in other LARPs. Yeah, buffer LARPs, they're phenomenal. But too many shields in... Uh, too many shields in battle games. So I think that's about it for, for this episode. That's, that's a little over three hours worth of us telling you what we think of you when we see your weapons. I think it kind of drifted into more of an explanation of how to use them at, at points, but hey, that's that's not a bad thing. Um, so yeah. We'll uh, we'll wrap this up. I'm Tycho. This is Erdok. These have been Fighting Words, and uh, we'll come back with some more.